so yeah, I introduced the, the members of a rock pile team that are related to this um, uh, this product. So RPS Tracker, we've been developing it now for about three and a half years. Um, it didn't start from nothing. Um, my colleague um, Bill Quintrell, um, he's one of my business partners here at Rockpile. He he started building a tracking solution prior to starting Rockpile. And when we started Rockpile, we kind of said, okay, why don't you join us and bring Tracker into the company, and then we can help develop it, help fund the development of it, and take it to where we think it could go. And so Bill and I have been working on it with Peter, our other business partner now for, as I say, the last three and a half years. Our first real major contract with the product started about um, a year after we'd been developing it um, internally at Rockpile. We signed up a contract with a Canadian company called QM Environmental. They they came to us through Trimble with a large uh, environmental cleanup project in Canada, and they had some very specific requirements around precise tracking of material movement and material quantities including you know importing load tickets and being able to track load quantities of different material types through different activities from excavation to stockpiling to remediation to dumping in a specific location whether it be an off-site uh, dump site or whether it be a, a specific fill location on site and they had to have very precise tracking of all the material that got moved on site for the client's benefit and they approached us and had this concept of like an amazon shipping you know we ship a parcel out of a location and we need to know where it's been all the way along its path to where it ends up and we need to track that against contractual line items so they they approached trimble and trimble said well they don't have anything the customer was looking at things like load right but load right was extremely expensive for the number of pieces of equipment they had to get scales on all their trucks and all their loadout uh, devices and so they approached us and said you know is there a way that you could do this cheaper but not necessarily cheap, but cheaper and provide us with a solution that gives us the reporting that our client wanted. So we we spent the best part of the the next sort of six to nine months working on custom solution for them because it was in the same wheelhouse that we wanted to be in. And we figured that a company with, you know, 50 assets running quite complicated um, earth moving operations would help us to develop what we think is the right kind of tool for this space. And the precise tracking is one of the most important pieces of what we're trying to do is it's it's all very well just knowing where your assets are on a dot on a map and knowing that they did a load over here and a dump over here, but knowing that precisely and knowing you got it right, because no matter how simple the site is, you can have relatively complex problems that you've got to solve. And so we've been trying to solve how do we reliably load data and know exactly where it came from? How do we reliably dump data? Or dump material and know where it went how do we reliably capture the type of material that's getting moved if you want to track that and then being able to turn that into meaningful actionable information that can be something that people on site can use supervisors foreman or people in back office can look at progress if you're an owner a manager or project lead you can look at the data and actually take some meaningful action items out of it and we're still working on that kind of we know what now we know what and where it's okay, what am I going to do about it? And what kind of information can we boil out of that data to give you instant snapshots of meaningful data that's helpful to you? And hopefully today we're going to show you some of the progress we've been making around that. And hopefully you can uh, ask questions or maybe point out things that you might like to see as a company if you were to deploy a system like the track and a solution. And we've now got a number of companies working with us over the summer here. Um, this year we, we've gone much bigger in terms of our push out to the market. We've picked out a few what we would consider to be relatively key customers for us that are, are working with us on our other side of the business, the TBC part, who also run fleets of earth moving equipment and um, would like help around tracking earth moving operations and material tracking, but more in a sort of mainstream earth moving operations. So we've said, OK, we need to find two or three big customers that are doing big jobs that are uh, are looking to solve these problems and would how will have valuable input. So we've been working with them now for the summer, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those projects here as we go through that they've given us approval to talk about. Um, so the team, the team that I have here on the call with us is um, I have Bill Contrell, who's my business partner. So Bill, just say good morning. Um, hey, good morning. 
and then I have Shane Odenberg. And Shane is um, one of our technical people, one of my consultants. He works closely with me on training, but he also goes out and spends time with people on site when we need it. And he's very capable with the TBC part of the business and uh, the tracker part of the business. So um, I invited, you know, wanted to have him on the call here because if any of you decide you want to do something with this, then Shane will be someone you're likely to interact with. So Shane, could say good morning. Good morning. Okay, so let's um, let's dive into Tracker. I'm going to start off with a few slides. I'm not going to bore you, hopefully, with a lot of PowerPoint, but I, I feel like Tracker is a fairly comp comprehensive product. In use, it can be extremely simple to use, and you look at it sometimes and you go, okay, what's it really doing for me? Because um, it, it's so simple to get at certain information types, and the reporting is so quick and so good. That you look at it and go, that was so easy, it, it can't be doing it right, kind of thing. And so I want to talk a little bit about the way it thinks and the way it works, because I think Tracker is a little unique. You know, my background with with Tracker started many years ago when I worked at Trimble and I was responsible for the, the Vision Link solution from a Trimble perspective, which I was never proud of, um, I have to say. Um, it was a joint venture with Caterpillar and Caterpillar basically drove the show. They 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 led the lead on that and they basically got whatever they wanted and Trimble was always second fiddle and as a result it was an extremely frustrating experience for me to work in that environment um, but I learned a lot in that process about what people are looking for and what a product like this should do and when I left Trimble three and a half years ago I, I took a step back and when Bill and I started talking about him working with us I was skeptical about did I want to go do this again and was this something that was really worth doing and was it really solvable and was it really a process that you know how much money was it going to take us if you like to to build something that would be valuable to the industry that would really make a difference and you know he and I discussed it long and hard for a long period of time before I kind of said okay yeah let's go do this Let's bring what he had as a tracker solution that he developed for a couple of trucking companies working in the mining industry. And it was extremely capable as a truck tracking solution, but it didn't have the specific Earthworks flavor that I feel we need as a company. And so we said, okay, but if we're going to do this, we're going to bring it into the Earthworks uh, space. And that's where we focus because that's primarily civil construction, civil earth moving is really where we're focused. So we want to do this really well and do it better than anybody. Is it really viable to do that with the funding and the available cash we have? So in realistic terms, over the last three and a half years, we've made money on the TBC side that we've been investing pretty heavily on the tracker side while we build out the platform and the solution. And the team we, we have on board for doing the work is a team that Bill and I have worked with for probably the best part of 15 years. We had them working for us at Trimble. They built things like TCC, the SketchUp 3D Warehouse. So they've got extremely good um, web skills. They're some of the best programmers I've ever worked with. And Bill's one of the best leads I've ever worked with in terms of being able to define, you know, precisely what people want and get an interface that really works for people. So we we embarked on this process and here we are three and a half years later on. And I think we're now just beginning to really get it into the mainstream of what people have been asking us for and what we're really looking for. So I want to kind of talk about where we're at today. So on the face of it, what is Tracker? Tracker is a a web-based browser software application so you can run it through any browser edge you know chrome whatever it, it is a web server uh, based solution when we talk about it from a multi-tenant perspective multi-tenant meaning many customers can log into the same system with a unique account typically people run an account per project or per depends on what kind of contractor you are if you're a small contractor working in a city and you've got three or four projects on the go at the same time you would run all of those projects within one um, environment probably but if you're a big company running multiple projects across the us for example then it's likely that each big project might be run as its own um, account so for a company like you know a keyword or a walsh or someone like that they would likely run the system as multiple accounts one for each major project um, and then the, the smaller companies would typically run one account which runs multiple projects. So depending on how you how you are as a company and how large a space and area you cover and how how um, isolated you want the data to be. In other words, you don't want a guy on one project messing with data from another project, for example. So if you want to be like that, then you would basically create an account for each project or each major project that you need. And there's no real cost for accounts or projects. It's more it's more just a data administration piece that 
makes it encapsulated, which means the people that work on that project can get to see that uh, that data and that account, uh, what's necessary for them to see. But it can also be, if somebody came to us tomorrow and said, hey, could I run Tracker on my own corporate network? So we get this a lot in mining operations, for example, they don't want any of their information on open internet. Can we run a solution like this on a private uh, network? And the answer is yes. We can deploy Tracker on any server network as well, and it can be then used through a browser but on a network as opposed to through the web. Um, it's a tracking solution, but it's a tracking solution that's been developed with earth moving and civil contractors as the primary uh, target, if you like. Um, we want to do this really well, and we're not being sidetracked into 100 different tracking applications because we're not just a dot on a map application, and we don't want to be that. So, it's good for use on your own machines, but also for any subcontractor's equipment. So you can bring in, you know, a subcontractor with new trucks today, and you can install the system in those trucks in a few seconds, and they can be starting to add real productivity information and real material movement information within, you know, five minutes. It's so it's fast and easy to deploy. It's a um, the, the, the the solution. I'm going to talk about it in more detail as we get into the next few slides. But it's fast and easy to deploy, and that's one of the key values of it. We don't want it to be something that's embedded in the engine compartment that takes four hours to install and route and cables to the antenna and cables to the power through the engine and through the you know the, the compartments of the machine. We want it to be something you can mag mount or vault to the wind you know windscreen to with uh, suction cups or you can put a screw fitting onto the dashboard and just bolt it to the dashboard or you can clamp it to the frame of the machine. But we want it to be something that you can put in a machine in seconds and start getting meaningful information. But you can expand it if you want to with, you know, hard wiring it into the truck's ignition or uh, truck's battery system. You can also add other sensors to it, and we'll talk about that as we go. Um, we're adding, starting to add sensors to the solution so that you can track uh, dumps in different ways, and we'll talk about how that works as we go. We wanted it to be extremely easy for operators to use uh, and give them the flexibility to be able to do things right every time, as opposed to getting it wrong some of the time, which is what a black box telematics will do for you all the time. Um, something with buttons, something with a display, something that has interaction for the operator means that you can put more control into the system and you can capture more information at the time of data capture. And the, the operators can feel a part of the system and they can also add value to the data that's getting collected by adding tickets or adding, you know, fuel quantities or adding, you know, material type that they're loading, et cetera. So an excavator can add to the solution and a truck operator can add to the solution. So it's primarily focused around loading and hauling operations today, but you can put it into any machine, but that's the main focus that we're at today. It's a 3D interface. So when you're working in the software in the back office, it's a 3D interface. So you can see your project in 3D and you can see where everything is working in 3D and I'll show you some live projects this morning. Um, and then uh, it's comprehensive, reliable reporting. That's one of our main focuses is here is how good is the reports and how easy are they to read? And how comprehensive are they in terms of giving you the inf information that you need reliably every day? And what does it really do? It tracks materials, loads, cycles, quantities, extremely precisely if you want it to, and it will track project progress and productivity. And that's where we're heading, and that's what we're trying to solve is this, where am I at in my project today? How much progress have we made? How much have we got to go? And what kind of production are we achieving compared to what we set out to do on this project? So that you get some feel for your job and whether it's going to come in on budget and time um, in the long run. What kind of utilization are you getting out of the equipment and the people that you've deployed on the project? Um, so is it 100% rock pile? Yes. Um, everything on this list is something that a lot of companies can say. I would say that based on my experience, not every company that says they can do this, do it well and do it precisely. And that's really our focus is trying to make sure that this is extremely good at what it does and it's extremely precise in what it does. So when you log in, uh, you have two parts of the solution. The first part is what we call Tracker Mobile, and this is a screen grab taken from um, within the software where we actually have 3D trucks moving around the site. And just to give you an idea of some of the detail that Bill and his team have been putting into this is 
This is the inside of a 777 cab, and you can see that in the mock-up model, which is 3D, which has a dump bed that moves and wheels that rotate, you also have inside the cab, if you actually navigate your way into the machine, you'll find that inside the machines, there is a tablet in the machine with the buttons on it. So this is what I've got circled there in orange is kind of how we see it being you know, installed. It's either clamped to the mach machine frame or it's, it's suction cup to the windscreen or it's um, you know, put onto a bracket that's screwed into the dashboard, or you can put it in a different set of mounts that can be screwed into the floor or mounted in the cup holders or whatever you have in the machine. So there's different ways of mounting it. We use standard RAM mounts for that. Using a standard off the shelf uh, Samsung Galaxy Active 3 tablet, which is a, a rugged tablet. And that tablet has an eight inch screen. And on that screen, you can see in the picture there, you have a colored screen, which right now is showing black. And on that screen, you have some colored buttons. And those buttons are programmable and you can set them up by location. So when a truck moves into a location, a location meaning a geofence, um, you get a set of buttons will show up on the screen based on what you told it to show up at that point. So if it's a loadout location, you can have a load or you could have a load button for different types of materials. So you could have load type one, load type two, load type three, and press the load button. And that tells me I've loaded a piece of, you know, post, I've loaded the equipment with this material type at this location. So the buttons could be like manual uh, push buttons. They can do different things like capturing fuel or maintenance events or capturing load and dump events. But they can also be fully automated buttons. Fully automated meaning when I pull into an area, I want to say this is a load up location, so load me automatically. And when I pull into this location, it's a dump location, so dump automatically. And then we have other tools like proximity and dump sensors and stuff like that that we're adding to the solution that allows you to automate it even further. So the, tr the tracker tablet is, as I say, a standard tablet. It's packed with uh, great technology, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It goes in the cab of the machine and the operator can interact with it. So when he presses one of those buttons, it can be just an action button. We just press it and it does something or it can press it and it can pop up a display that allows you to take a photograph for a ticket or you can enter the fuel quantity or you can pick a material from a material list or whatever. So you can define the buttons. They're programmable. We can create button types to suit different types of activity fairly quickly. That connection capturing of data and that cap data goes into the database and then that database is very flexible and we can then write reports that can mine that data to give you the reports that you need. So every time you press a button, we know the date and time, we know the position of the button of when the button was clicked. So that gives us kind of event position, location, time capturing. When you drive in and out of geofences, the tablet knows that you've crossed the geofence because we store all of the geofences inside the system, so we know it's uh, it's it's crossing over and entering an area, or it's leaving an area, and that can trigger clock uh, timers that says if you're in this area for more than 30 seconds, I want you to dump. If you're in this area for more than 30 seconds, I want you to load, etc. So the the buttons on the screen are extremely flexible, and we're open to customization um, of the product, especially in the early days of this product development and evolution. A lot of the work we've done has been very successful because we've been able to customize very specifically to what people are asking us to do. And we're very open to do that. Whereas if you work with a much bigger company that's got thousands of users, they're probably not so open to doing rapid customization and reporting to meet your needs. And we did a lot of customization work, for example, for that QM project in Canada, because that was one of our first customers and they had a lot of very good needs. And we felt that that was something we wanted to really solve. And then on the side, the other side of the, the function is the Office software. The Office software is um, a web, you know, web application. It runs in your browser, and it provides you a 3D graphical interface as well as reporting and some other functionality. And we'll show you how that works. And you can access it in the office using your laptop, or you can access it through a tablet on, in the field should you want to do that. And you can interact and see the same information wherever you, you uh, come at it from. And it's extremely flexible, and we'll talk about that as we get into it. So the Samsung Galaxy Active 3 tablet, you know, this is the device that we use. This is a photograph from the you know, Samsung website. We've superimposed our application into it just to kind of give you an idea what it looks like. And so the, you know, the on-screen, you know, use for the customer is the things that make a difference is up at the top here, you get some action information. So you can change, you know, you can see messages that come in from the back office of dispatcher. You can see what haul profile you've got loaded. The haul profile is, you know, how you're loading the truck. So you might have, you know, a triple seven truck, and you might run it, you know, with struck load. You might run it underloaded. You might run it overloaded, depending on what, how you want to uh, run that. And each one of those can have its own uh, material quantity per haul. 
And so we're setting up the different hall profiles. The truck operator can change the whole profile if they need to, um, or you can disable that so they can't. And then up here, it's telling you right now that this truck is empty. Therefore, the load button is up and you're in a cut zone. So the screen color can change when you move into a geofence. So if you're going into a cut zone, this could go red. If you're going into a fill zone, it could go blue. If you're going into a fueling zone, it could go orange. If you're going into a maintenance zone, it could go you know, purple or whatever color you want. All of that's fully customizable so that the operator gets some visual feedback that you've entered a zone and now you've got some buttons. The buttons that are on screen will change based on how you've programmed each zone on the back end. So when he pulls into a cut zone, in this case, he's getting a load material button, but he could have six buttons here for different materials and he could have other buttons on the side for maintenance and fuel and other things that might happen at the same time. So he can have this can be very simple. Or it can be very, um, not very complicated, but more buttons on there to give them more choices. So, for example, one of the sites we're going to show you, they have a quarry. They can load six different materials out of that quarry. They didn't want to have a load button where they pick a material. They wanted to have six buttons on the screen, one for each material. So they have load type one, load type two, load type three. So the operator just says, I'm loading this type of material. Click on that button. And that becomes the default material type that's getting loaded for every subsequent load until he chooses something different kind of thing. So we automate the first press and then after that it's fully automated after there. And you know if you're doing things on site there's various messages if you want to send a message to tell the operator to change route, you know go from a different location to a different location, you can tell him to do that and he'll get a message on here he can accept it and when he's accepted it he then diverts himself to that route. And so you can communicate and talk to the operator remotely without having to actually call him up and talk to them physically. The tablet is extremely rugged. It's been extremely reliable. We've had these running now for three, three plus years on projects, and we've only had one issue with a battery on one unit in that whole time. And uh, we're still working through some other things that are coming up on some of the more recent projects where we're trying to diagnose some battery um, power things where people aren't putting power in properly or they're not connected up. Permanently, they're just kind of semi permanently. And as a result, you get different kind of issues come up. So we've been making some changes to the back end software to enable us to troubleshoot and look at those in more detail and provide better advice to people when they call us for help. Um, but in general, this tablet has been a fantastic device for us. We not Mr. B in Canada. Three out of the four jobs we've got running just recently, they've all been running pretty, pretty perfectly. I would say one job where they're not putting permanent power in. We've had a couple of issues that we're working through and we're still trying to make this more and more robust as we go. Um, what I like about the tool is it's fast and easy to install. We put it into a RAM mount mounted in the cab and the, te the technology inside these tablets is phenomenal. I mean, it, everybody knows with a phone what you can do with a phone. A tablet is no different, but these have got GPS cell, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, camera front and rear. They've got IMUs, which is like a vibration sensor or you know, an uh, inertial thing that can detect, uh, detect movement. They have a compass that can detect rotation. They have a touchscreen, they have date and time, and they have a whole bunch of other stuff too. But this gives us all of the connectivity that we need to be able to do all the things that we do. And I'm gonna talk about how we use each of these things as we go. And then the RAM mount gives us a permanent power supply in the cabin. If you'd use those and you wire them into the machine, we typically see no power problems. If you use some other method like the cigarette lighter or you or you have some other power supply that you connect to in the cab and you're running multiple things, we find that operators disconnect them and stuff. And as, as a result, when that happens, you may get some power down issues because the, you know, the battery will drain out if you don't have power connected to it eventually. Um, and so, but when you plug it back in again, it comes back up automatically. Um, it is locked down. The tablets can only run one application when you run our kiosk software on the tablet. So we have a custom version of a kiosk product that, that we provide with this. That locks the tablets down so the operators can't get into the operating system. They can't do anything unless you give them all the, uh, the login controls to do that. Um, and then they can only use tracker. So if the device powers down, when it powers up, it comes up with tracker automatically. If you have to reset the device, it comes up with tracker automatically. So there's no way that the tablet can be running, you know, any kind of open internet with any other access, which could distract an operator and do make them, let them do other things. It's a very reliable, robust system that every morning they pick up, if they have to take the tablets out of the truck. We, in the middle of the screen, we will put like a serial number, not a serial number of the tablet, but a serial number of the machine in the middle of the screen so that when they come in the morning to pick up their tablet, they can look at the tablets. If you turn it 90 degrees, it shows you that serial number. 
and so they can work out which tablet was theirs from yesterday and jump it straight back in the machine and carry on. So it's it's a it's designed for either permanent mount where you leave it in the cab all the time or you take it out at night and then put it back in every morning. And depending on how you operate, it will work both ways. The Canada project, they put them all in a, in a cabin at night and then in the morning, the operators come into the cabin for their daily meeting and they take away the tablet and get going as soon as they get back into the machine. They just drop it into the cradle and it's already running, it's already tracking. So you can see the operators walking from the site cab into the machine because they're carrying the tablet while they do it. So the usable, usable technology inside the tablets, we have all these different sensors. GPS gives us position, motion, speed, and direction. So we know by, you know, course made good, by tracking a machine over time, we know which way it's going. We know the speed that the machine is going. We know that it's in motion or not in motion, and we know its position at any particular point in time as a result of the GPS. And we can compare that with things like geofences to determine it's inside a geofence or not, but it's crossing a geofence, you know, on the way in or the way out. So we get a lot of information from just GPS. Cell phone, we need cell phone for communication. So the cellular system in supports, you know, um, all of the cell phone carriers, ATT, Bell, uh, Rogers up in Canada. It supports, uh, we have a SIM, uh, SIM service that we subscribe to with a company that gives us data pooling, which gives us the ability to sell you a plan at a lower cost because we pool all our data and we take care of that for you as part of the package if you want us to, or you can use your own SIM cards in it if you want to. Um, Wi-Fi gives us the ability to communicate with um, things like scales. So we have a, a big mining operation in uh, Virginia that's using our systems and they, as they pull over a way bridge, we connect to the scale and pull the scale information directly into the system. So we can do that kind of thing and communicate with other uh, things by Wi-Fi. And if you haven't got self-service, you could put a Wi-Fi hotspot up somewhere on site. And when the machines are getting close to that, they'll drain uh, the recorded data as they pass the Wi-Fi hotspot, for example. So if you park up over lunch, you could have a Wi-Fi hotspot there, capture data all morning, pull into the, the lunch area. And when the machine pulls in, it would start draining the morning's data. So if you don't have good permanent cell connection, then Wi-Fi can be used to, to do that as well. Long range Bluetooth, it has long range Bluetooth. So with that, we have worked out how to do things like proximity between devices. So the Bluetooth can communicate between different devices. So we have an excavator with a tablet. We have a, a truck coming in to, to the excavator. We can determine that they're close to each other. And we know which excavator is the closest because of the, the signal strength. And as a result, we can associate the truck with an excavator. The excavator can be set to be loading a certain type of material so we can track how much material was actually of a certain type was put in a truck and if you want to you can have excavator bucket counting so as the excavator is putting bucket loads into the truck we can count how many bucket loads it took to load each truck for example so we can do a lot of stuff with bluetooth and we transfer that information to the truck so we say okay you got loaded and it took six bucket loads to load you so the truck knows and keeps a track of how much uh, how many bucket loads per truck load uh, are required and the long range Bluetooth also allows us to add in things like sensors. So we're starting to use some what we call beacon sensors um, for doing things like dump sensing. And it allows us to connect between the tablet and the, um, uh, the, the sensor to capture the dump events that way if we need to. Cameras, it has front and rear facing cameras. When you've got it in a mount, the, the front facing camera is helpful because if you have a ticket for a load or a dump or a fuel event, you can just capture the ticket uh, digitally as, a, as an image, and that goes into the data record and it's stored with the fuel event or the maintenance event or whatever you're capturing tickets for. You can store those in the database and recall them so the back office people get them. They're not sitting in somebody's footwell because they didn't uh, hand it in at the end of the day or the end of the week. Um, it has an IMU sensor and that gives us vibration and we, if you have the, the tablet mounted permanently in the machine or mounted on the windscreen, the vibration sensor can detect changes in vibration. So we can identify things like when you turn the ignition on and turn the ignition off, we can see a difference in the vibration trace of the machine and use that to determine ignition on and ignition off events. And because we can do that, we know the date and time when the ignition went on, we know the date and time when it went off, so we can count the number of hours and we can add that to an hour meter reading to give you machine hours as well, should you want to do that. Um, compass, we use that for rotational motion. So we we, we treat movement or, or you know, working versus idling. We treat working as motion, and motion for an excavator might not be movement, it might be rotation. So we use rotation to determine bucket loads, but we also use rotation to determine activity, and activity is then used for determining working versus idle time for that type of machine. 
So we're starting to use the compass for a number of things, but those things are uh, the current uh, implementations. Then we have things like touchscreen. Touchscreen gives us the operator to make selections and he can enter extra data or tell the system what material he's using, or he can respond to um, messaging coming from the back office. And as a result, not necessarily by typing stuff, but just accepting. OK, I get it. I need to change route kind of activities. And then date and time, obviously, the, the, you know, the device has a clock in it and a date and time in it. So we can get all our event tagging um, tied to all the other elements of this all at the same time and date. And so that gives us all the data capturing that we need to better feed the back office. So a lot of good stuff in the technology um, and it, it comes with a very simple implementation, a very simple installation as a result. Um, so RPS Tracker as a product, it, it uses the concept of routes, locations and what we call action buttons. I've talked about the action buttons a little bit. They're the buttons that are on the tablet. But it has this concept of routes, locations, um, and I want to talk about that a little bit because that's kind of a fairly unique uh, concept and it gives us an extremely flexible way of working. It, it, Tracker has the the concept of projects, but projects can be a project like you would normally consider them, or a project could be an entire city of activity where you might be running multiple projects. So a project is not as specific as maybe you would think it would be initially. Um, this is an example of how Tracker could be used. So any of the orange lines could be an individual site. Uh, those individual sites might have geofences in them. So where I talk about P, that's a project, and C is a cut zone, and F is a fill zone. So we just take project three, for example. It's got you know three zones on the site, uh, two cut zones, one fill zone. And a, a, a project route could be just as simple as those three locations, the, the cuts and the fill locations within that project boundary. So if all your machines are running around inside that boundary and that's all they're doing, that could be the concept of a project. But if you've got a, you know machines that are going to a borrow pit and they're servicing more than one project in a city, for example, then if you want to run it as one operation, you can make a single route that has all of these things in it, maintenance, fuel, different projects, different cut and fill zones. And so every time a machine crosses any one of the boundaries that are drawn there, we would know that it entered the borrow pit and it entered the M1 area of the borrow pit. Therefore, we know it's getting that material type, for example. And if it entered the M2, it's getting a different type of material. And if it entered M3, it's getting a different type of material again. So we know by geofencing and locations what the machine is actually doing. Is it loading? Is it dumping? Is it picking up a specific type of material? So there's a lot of value add that we put in to the geofencing and the fact we can nest geofences on top of each other, you know, we can capture that I entered the borrow pit and then I entered M1 and therefore I collected M1 material. Um, and if you're doing things like batch plant, you know, batch plant to site, if you're manufacturing concrete or asphalt and you're moving it from there to a location on a project, again, we know it came into the batch plant, therefore it's getting concrete and it ended up delivering that concrete to this location on this project um, if you're running more than one project again in the city. Things like fueling, you got fuel stations on site or fuel stations that you're buying purchase fuel. And when you pull into there, it knows it's fueling and therefore it asks you how much fuel you're, you're putting into the truck. And if you've got a ticket for that, then you can capture the ticket and put it into the database so that you've got the fuel tickets in the back office as soon as you've done the fueling event. So you can move around here. So a route basically can be extremely flexible. A route could be, I've just got two areas, a cut zone and a fill zone, and I'm just running between those two. But it could be three cut zones and three fill zones, and you're running between any of them at any time. So a route isn't a path from A to B to C to D. It's a collection of locations to which you can go to. And when you go to those locations, it's programmed to tell you what to do when you get there. OK, and um, a location is defined as a geofenced area that has additional properties like a geofence can have, you know, a title, it can have a boundary, it can have a screen color when the tracker pulls in. It can define the action buttons like load, auto load, proximity load, fuel maintenance, whatever things you want to go on there. And it can capture all of that information in uh, a set of events. And then a project in Tracker can be a collection of routes, but routes and locations do not have to belong to a project. So you can have routes that go between multiple projects if you want to. Um, it depends on what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to produce as a set of results and the kind of company and the size of the company that you are. Um, so you, it, it's extremely flexible. And you can also, in addition to all of these things, you can also tag any event. So tags can be used to kind of associate events with a specific project. So if you want to know 
every time a machine enters this area, it's tagged with project three. We can capture the number of hours that any machine that's traveling between projects spends on any individual project, and we can report all of that on the back end. So if you want to see your breakdown of how much time each piece of equipment has spent servicing different projects, you can do that as well, should you need to do it. So we're trying to give you a lot of tools here that can be used to determine and slice and dice the information on the back end to suit what you're trying to achieve. So um, events in Tracker are things that happen, and events can be manually or automatically triggered. So examples could be we turn on the engine of the machine, therefore the vibration increases, so we track uh, an ignition on event. The vibration is turned off or it reduces significantly, so we know that the engine has been turned off, and they become events, date and time, location, and we know the ignition on, ignition off. Entry and exit events, when you machine drives into a boundary or leaves a boundary, we know it happened. Um, so we have entry and exit events. Push button events, when the operator presses a button um, to capture something, we know that that event occurred, but you can also have these auto buttons where the button is is functional and active all the time. If you pull into the zone and you wait there for- I got my car wreck. <clears throat> Hold um, this car. That was already almost paid off, so. Hey. I come up with a good idea. Clayton. Wait, no. We mute Clayton, guys. Okay. Um, so things like button events, the auto load, auto dump is when something occurs and a certain amount of time elapses. So auto load, auto dump, you can set it so that if the truck is in an area for more than 20 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever, then trigger a load event. If the truck is in that area and it pauses for more than a certain number of seconds, then trigger the event. So you've got flexibility on how you set that up. And then on top of that, you've also got things like proximity loading. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So the event captures date, time, location associated with the asset and the operator that was doing it and can pick up all this additional tag information. So manual tagging, automatic tagging, but also additional information that are coming from sensors or from internal readings off the device. So events are all plotted on the map in, in, the, in the 3D view and can be mined for detailed information. So you can then mine all these events for loads completed, dumps completed, cycle times between load to load, load to dump, dump to load, dump to dump. So you can do any combination of those between any two locations. Um, material quantities moved by material type, um, miles driven um, by the trucks each day, uh, working motion, that could be rotational linear motion versus idling, which is the machine is on, but it's not got any motion at all for longer than a certain period of time. And speeding events, we use the GPS to determine speeding. You can say, when I'm running this report, show me all events when the machine was growing greater than 30 miles an hour. So that can help you with things like safety and on-road uh, compliance and stuff like that. If you get problems with specific drivers, then you can prove to them and to other people that they were or weren't speeding on that road at that particular point in time. So a lot of information in here that can help you solve a number of problems that can come up every day. So whole tracking. Um, Primary tracker is a haul tracker, so it, it determines load locations and dump locations, and it can do that in a number of different ways. And this is an evolving science as we come across more kind of corner cases or more issues on different job sites. And again, I'm going to talk about even simple jobs have issues that need to be solved. So we started out with we just want to capture the load and we just want to capture the dump. So on the tablet, we have a load button where you press the screen and that triggers, you know, uh, a load event and you have a button on the screen and you capture a dump event and then people said okay like the company in Canada they wanted to have well we need to know what materials getting loaded and that could come from an excavator by proximity or it can come by the operator determining what they're getting loaded with so when you press the load button can you ask me for a material selection and then it's like well we've only got three materials so don't keep asking me just let me press a button for the material that I'm not, I know I'm loading. I'm going to three different locations, each one is a different material. So just give me the material button. So I just press the material button and it knows it's captured a load of that material. So it's a very simple kind of process. And, you know, the initial reaction a lot of people have to button pressing is, well, my operators are going to forget to do that. And, you know, that is true. Operators, when they haven't been trained, may forget to do it. You may miss a load occasionally. But we don't let you load unless you've dumped previously. So if you had a load, you have to dump it before you can pick up a load. So when you come back to the load location, you know, the operator goes, oh, shit, I got a load and I forgot to dump. So they, we, we just recently added, an, oops, I forgot the dump button. And when you press that, 
it will basically say where did you dump the material you can pick it from a list and it will then capture that load and put it in the right place uh, for you so there's things that we're identifying that we kind of know that they're an issue and operators especially when they're new and they haven't been trained yet or they haven't got into the habit of using this yet they might forget so then we said okay well then let's go another level up and go auto load so you go to auto load and you know the way that works is you drive into a load location and if you've been there for a certain period of time it will capture a load and if you drive into a dump location if you've been there for a certain length of time or you pause for a certain length of time then it can capture a dump event and that works for a lot of people and the, the upside of it is it's automatic the operator doesn't have to press any buttons the downsides are that if you have to drive through a dump zone to get to a dump zone then which one is the right one and that's a problem you know so you can't use auto dump if you're having to drive through another dump location currently um we're debating whether we need to do more about that and the other thing is that when you do auto load auto dump it's doing it based on a time basis so it's capturing the fact you did a load in a location and you did a dump in a location but it doesn't capture the precise location of that load or that dump and that's another debate that we're having internally as to is that important for people like do you want to see the spread of the materials do you want to see exactly where you're dumping right now because if there is then we need to come up with another way of doing auto dump so that it captures the auto dump so if you don't press a, a, a button to say it was precisely here it would still capture it but if you want to it would pop up maybe you press a button when you know you're dumping at that precise location and if you don't press that button when you exit the dump location it would capture it automatically so you at least capture it but maybe you'd lose the precision if the operator can't be bothered to press a single button as he goes through that location but in practice what we find is the manual works great the auto works great for capturing just the basic information but we're refining it continuously as we get more feedback and as we capture more details from the people that are using it and then the last one is proximity load um, and dump switch so proximity load is already up and running when you have an excavator you can put a tablet in an excavator it can be broadcasting that it's proximity loading so it's broadcasting i'm loading this material on this this excavator and when a truck comes within range it says okay i can see a truck and it starts telling the truck what material is getting loaded the truck sees the excavator and says okay i know i'm getting this material and then at that point the operator of the excavator can also decide whether he wants to do bucket counting if that's what you want him to do and every time he swings and puts a load into the truck it captures the fact that he he dug a, a bucket load and put it into that truck so we know that it started with seven loads and it ended with 12 therefore there's five loads went into that truck to get loaded so proximity loading kind of makes it an auto load but with some sensor technology that that forces it to happen at the right place whereas the auto load is telling you there's a load in that area but it may not be exactly in the right place right so proximity is another step up which gives you more accuracy but you do have to put a tablet into the excavator to make that happen or the loader um, if you're using a dump switch for the dump location that's new it's in development it's uh, hopefully going to be ready in not too distant future and it's a load, bensing, load bed sensing or ejector tailgate sensing sensor that you basically um, clamp to the, the load bed if it's a tip truck. And, and when the truck goes up above a certain angle, the sensor determines that and then says, OK, you dumped. If it's on the ejector type trucks, we put it on the rear end of the truck. And when the tailgate drops down for the ejector to work, then we sense that event and we know, therefore, it must be dumping at that point. So while well, again, it's not maybe a perfect foolproof, totally 100% foolproof, it's 99% foolproof, and that will give you an accurate dump in the right location on the load bed of the truck. If it's a side tip uh, truck, as long as you can find a place on the, the, the rolling of the side bed, you can capture the change in slope and put that in, and then you could use the side bed loading. And if it's a belly dump truck, again, as long as you can find somewhere to mount it where the, there's a change in slope caused by the dumping event, then you can do that. And again, it's a long range Bluetooth connection. Um, these sensors, I'm going to talk about those in a few minutes to show you what they look like and, and how they're going to be mounted and stuff. So proximity load, I just want to show you kind of how that works. You place a, a tracker mobile in the loading device, whether it be an excavator or, or a wheel loader or whatever. The loader has a screen and it says proximity loading, and that's the button that you can see. And it will tell you what material is loading and it will tell you how many bucket loads that you've done today if you're doing bucket counting and it, it's in that sort of broadcast mode so that's all the operator has to do if he wants to change the material he can press the material button and then he'll get the list of materials he can change the material he can enable bucket counting and i'll show you a little video of how that works in a minute 
So the loader has one screen. The operator can click on the button to set material. Truck pulls up, detects proximity loading, message from the loader and locks in on the loader. Uh, when they're close to each other, the truck gets load activity and material being loaded from the broadcast. And you can also get the buckets in the count on the machine. So, you know, when you're running this, this isn't very interesting. You know, when you run this, it tells you what material is getting loaded and it keeps, you know, switching between material loading and the bucket count and the material that you're working with. If you want to change anything, just press the button and it allows you to change the settings. That's really all this screen would do for the excavator. And at the same time, we're positioning the excavator. So we're getting its location and stuff. So you're getting, you know, dot on the map for the excavator. You're getting working and idling time. You're getting bucket counts and stuff and how many machines and things it's loading on the back end as a result of having this tracking in the excavator. Now, a lot of people look at us and go, well, we don't really need the excavator set up with a system. It seems a bit excessive. It's not giving us anything truly valuable eyes other than the location of the excavator. Some people look at it and go, no, absolutely, it's giving us valuable information. In fact, the operator can choose the material and that drives the whole process. Like in the Canada, Canadian company, they absolutely wanted that. And so it depends on who you are and what you're trying to do as to whether you need to put these in the excavator or not. If you want to, it's there. And if we go to the next screen here, the bucket loading, this is how this works. And again, on here, this is the excavator screen and how it works. And this is an excavator working with a truck that's pulling in to get loaded. So I just want to play this little video just to show you how this works in practice. So when I play this, the come on. Okay. Uh, play now. Come on. Play with this. Try again. I think it's just taking a few seconds to buffer up here. There we go. Uh, for some reason the video is not playing. Yeah. It's playing. See is the it playing? Oh, there we go. It's playing now. Yeah. Okay. So the truck comes in and the excavator is preparing the material that it's going to be using. Uh, in, in the excavator, you set up a, a load location, which is to the left of the excavator when he's looking out of the front view of the window. So the truck comes into that load location, he loads a bucket and he swings around. And when he swings into the area that you've defined as the load zone, and you can basically define that by a left and right. So the guy says start left, start right, that defines the load zone. And so every time he swings out, that's a bucket count. And every time he swings back in, he's dumped that bucket load into the truck. So he can pick, you know, uh, several uh, bucket loads to load the truck. And you can see there's a bucket counting going on there all the time. So he can, with this screen, he can pick the material that's getting loaded. He can calibrate the load zone for the trucks. He can do one on the left and one on the right if he wants to. So he can have two load zones going on at the same time. And then it's going to do the capturing of the bucket counts and putting the material into the truck loading operation so that the truck knows that it's getting this amount of material in the truck that's being hauled from this location to somewhere else. So it captures the load event, captures the materials being loaded, captures the number of bucket loads at the same location, and it kind of fully automates the process and gives the excavator a role within the overall process that can be used to value add the whole data stream that's coming in. It's kind of pretty neat, and that's kind of give you an idea of how proximity works, right? So um, let's move to the next screen. So when we look at automated dumping, you know, let's say we have manual dump, we have auto dump, and then we have proximity for loading, and then we're looking at dumping. What else could we do in dumping? And you know, we want a reliable location for dump. We want to be able to handle that fully automatically without having to need geofences. And how could we do that? So we invested in looking at technologies that we could incorporate, and we've created this DS1 dump sensor that's in uh, final development now. The sensor is fully functional. It's a battery-powered, Bluetooth-operated device. It's designed to be disposable. You can just take the, the the little black box off the magnet mounts. You can mount it with magnets, or you can do you know a hard mount to it if you want to. The idea is that it will run for uh, up to three years on one battery, so you don't need to replace the battery every week or every month or anything like that. It's going to last you a long time. It will broadcast its battery level each time it sends information, so that we know where it's at from a battery standpoint, so we know when it's coming up for replacement. But when it comes up for replacement, we figured that these devices they're relatively cheap um, so that you can buy them and dispose of them. If there's one with a fault, you can just replace it. If it doesn't have a fault, but it goes for three years and the battery dies, then you can just throw it away and replace it with a new one. The unit is like sealed waterproof housing with silicon filled. 
the device inside is very simple, very small in terms of its power consumption. It runs Bluetooth, but it sleeps when it's not in use. So consequently, it's using very little power every day, and it only really transmits when the event in the device happens and you program the sensor technologies. We do that for you um, based on the, the, the methodology you want to capture it. And typically on a big, big truck like a 777, you're going to mount it underneath the roof. You can see the red circle there. That's kind of where you would mount it on the uh, front of the tip there. That way it's close to the, the tablet. The Bluetooth range is very small, but you can go much further than that. And even with all the steel around, it will uh, provide the connection without any problem. And then when the truck tips by more than a certain angle, we capture the fact that it's a dump event. So of course you might be going uphill or downhill, so you don't want to put in a tip angle, which is less than the slopes that you typically encounter on site and what could be caused by you know vibration or whatever. And then after that, you get to an area where once it gets above, let's say 30 degrees or 40 degrees, you know it's tipping. So it trigger the event when it gets to that angle that you think is the right angle for your machines. And of course, once you've installed it, you can always tweak and adjust the settings to get it to be optimized for what you're trying to do. And then if you look at things like a um, an ejector truck where you have the tailgate, the tailgate tips down, you can put the sensor on the tailgate. So when the tailgate tips down, it will uh, capture the, the dump event and then the ejector will push the material out of the back, back of the truck. So you can use the sensor to do pretty much any type of uh, dump event where the load bed will change in some way to capture a slope change that would give us the ability to capture that as a trigger event. So dump sensor installation, again, quick and simple. You clean the surface with an alcohol wipe. You apply a couple of drops of silicon adhesive to the magnets. You attach the magnets, which will use the magnetics to, to grow, but the silicon adhesive is there to uh, add extra uh, strength. But you can scrape it off with a scraper without any problem to get them detached from the machine. Um, low cost disposable design, so extremely rugged. Um, you can throw them away and replace them when they need replacing batteries. And the battery life has a minimum of one year, but expected life is two to three years, depending on the operation that you're running. If you're running eight by five or you're running 24 by seven, of course, you're going to be doing more loads and more dumps. So the battery life will go down towards more of a year if you're doing 24 seven. But if you're doing, you know, eight by five or eight by six or 10 by six, then it's going to last you closer to three years. So depending on how long you use the system for, each week will trigger how much uh, battery life will get drawn out of the device. And it sleeps in between trigger points, so you don't use battery when it's not uh, being uh, loaded, when it's not doing any dumping. Again, you can fit this in a few minutes, no cabling, um, nothing to worry about other than just attaching it to the machine. And as soon as it's attached, it will connect to the device and we associate the device with the sensor. So we know that that is the sensor on this truck, so it's not gonna pick up something with a, a sensor on a different truck if they happen to be working closely with each other. And you place it on a dump axis with the um, indicator on the device pointing upwards. So when the tip bed goes up, the arrow on the front of our device needs to be pointing towards the direction of upslope. And as long as that's the case, then the dump will be captured. And we can only capture a dump when it's when the machine is loaded. So it doesn't let you dump and then dump again. So the guy tips the bed up and then drops it and then tips it up again for some reason. You're not going to count it as two dumps. You're only going to get the first one because it can't dump a second time until it's loaded again, right? So that's the way our software works. If you are doing half loads, so you dump half a load somewhere and then half a load somewhere else, currently we don't support that. But again, that's something we, I'm sure we could look at should it be a need. Um, once loaded, the machine can only dump. It can't load again until it's dumped. So once empty, it can load again. Um, there are good reasons why you need these different methods of load and dump. So, for example, if you have to go to an undefined location, so nobody's had time to set up a geofence, it's a new location where you're going to be dumping material and there's no geofence there when you get there. So having a manual dump button on the screen when you're outside all geofences makes sense because then you can dump anywhere you want on site and you can solve that problem temporarily while somebody's establishing a geofence. Now, our database doesn't require the geofence to be there at the time when the dump occurred. If you put geofences on afterwards, we can still mine the data uh, within the geofences after the fact. So you can add geofences to the system and, and then still capture those dump locations later. Um, you have to drive through one dump location to get to the dump location you're trying to dump in. So one of the projects we're going to show you in a few minutes is a dam project where they've got an upstream and a downstream location on the dam. And you have to drive through one of them to get to the other one but they're dumping in both locations alternately. And so 
if you use auto dump on both locations, you wouldn't uh, you would get the first one every time and you wouldn't get the second one. So auto dump doesn't work in that situation. So you have to have an alternative way of doing it. Um, not all machines will have a dump switch on them, so you can't automatically rely on every machine having a dump switch. So therefore you have to have an alternative method. And not all excavators or loaders will have a tracker mobile, so you can't always use proximity. So you have to have auto load or manual load as an option. So when you set up manual load and dump operations, it's possible that the operator will forget to tap the dump button and will only remember to do so when they get back to the load location. It happens. We've got some good examples of that where the guy is driven up to the dump, dumps off, can't, you know, he's not paying attention. He drives back to the, the load location and goes, oh shit, I forgot to press the dump button. So one of the requests we got from the project I'm going to show you is, you know, can we have an oops, I forgot to dump. And then as soon as we did that, it was, well, oh, can I have an oops, I forgot to load button as well. So we're working on that at the moment. And um, that basically allows you to press the button, say, oops, I forgot to dump. And it will then say, okay, where did you dump? The last location or one of the locations that you've driven through, you know, it's part of the route that you're working. Um, and then you can correct that and it will put the dump in the right location and capture the number. So the fact we don't allow you to load until you've dumped means that you're not going to start pressing a dump button and dump a load in the load location because you need to dump off the material before you start loading again, right? So you don't end up with the data in the wrong place. It doesn't affect your cycle times overall, but it would affect your load to dump and dump to load cycles if you don't get it in the right place. So this is how the OOPS button works. So you have two buttons, dump and OOPS dump, and you could have auto auto dump in here as well if you wanted to. And so if you forget to dump, you press the OOPS dump button. And when you do that, it says, where do you want to place it? You can put it in your current location, which might be wrong. You might put it in the same position as you dumped 13 minutes ago or whenever you last dumped, or you could pick a recent location. These are other locations that are part of your route that you've been to and where you've dumped material and you can pick one of them and then hit save and it will then put the dump in that location to correct the data record if you want to do that. And if that fails, we're also working on the ability to correct uh, load and dump locations. If they're wrong, you could add, add them in or correct them if you need to later on. So let's take a look at a real project. Um, but just before we do that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the key elements that I'm going to show you here is there's a number of functions of the software that you typically are going to use every day. There's a lot more that I'm not going to go through here that are more the detail around how we can relate uh, material quantity movements to particular contract line items. And if you're interested in talking to that, I'll have Bill talk about that at the end of the session here and maybe show a few things around that for those that you might be interested in looking at it. And that's more from the QM uh, project in Canada. So the first thing is the equipment snapshot. An equipment snapshot is designed to give you like an overview of selected equipment activity by day. So it's the first thing you look at every morning. You come in, you run your equipment snapshot, you can see that all your trucks have started. You can see what time they started. You can see how many loads and dumps they've done, how much mileage they've driven. And it sorts the data by machine based on the highest performers at the bottom and the lowest performers at the top. So if you have somebody who starts an hour later than everybody else, he'll be running short on loads for the morning at that particular point in time, and therefore he'll be at the top of the list because he's got the, the, the poorest performance. Doesn't mean to say he's a poor operator, it just means he's got the poorest performance for the day. And you can step backwards day by day and take a look at the activity of previous days, and you can compare where you're at today with where you were at the same time yesterday kind of thing. Um, dispatcher is a real-time view of equipment activity. So I can go to Dispatcher, I can see all my machines, what they're doing, where they're working, where they're at currently, and then you can click on any machine and see when it last reported. You can see how many loads and dumps it's done and all that kind of thing. And if you're interested in something specific about that machine, you can click on the machine and it will take you to its detailed report for the day. Travel journal, that's a historical review of equipment activity. So for each piece of equipment, we have a journal that tells you when it entered and exited, when it turned on, when it turned off, when it loaded, when it dumped during the day. So any activity or event it has becomes a sequence of journal entries. And you can scroll through the journal and you can play back a day's activity or a few minutes activity from any particular point in time and see exactly what it was doing at any particular point in time. So if you've got some strange behavior going on, for some reason, you know, machines going to where they shouldn't be going or machines going off script, then you can take a look at that in more detail to try and diagnose what's going on. And then we have a volume snapshot, which is currently a pre-release preview. It's in everybody's system, so anybody who's got our software can use it today. But it is a, a kind of a hidden feature right now. Um, because we're still refining some of the graphics and stuff, but we're planning to release that sometime over the next uh, six weeks or so. Um, 
uh, in terms of full production, but right now it's a snapshot that you can take a look at and, and start looking at what it can do for you. And then we have the reporting functions and they're the sort of detailed reporting of like your event report, your cycle time reports, which give you load dumps and cycle times and your material movements and then your statistics reports, which is, you know, give me more detail per load, per dump, per material, per route, per driver, et cetera. And then the last report we call deep location analysis that allows you to really look at where your equipment has been working, which projects it's on, which boundaries it's been working in, and whether it's been working or idling in that period of time. So when it's turned on in motion or not in motion, and we can break down detail after the fact on any boundary that you had or any boundary that you want to draw to do that analysis. So if you want to analyze a problem of machines, you know, clashing with each other at an intersection, for instance, of whole roads, you could, you know, put a window around the the, the intersection and then do a complete analysis of all the equipment over a given period of time and see things about what kind of delays that's causing you for that operation, for example. So those are the key elements. Let's go take a look at a project and see what that looks like. So let's just come out of here a minute and let's go to tracker. So this is a project that they've given us approval to talk about here that we've been working on this summer um, here in Colorado. Um, it's a big dam project and the customer has got uh, a bunch of 777 machines wired up currently and they're looking at adding it to a bunch of 740 machines as well on the site. But right now we're tracking the 777 activities. So they have about 10 777s working on this job. And just again, I give you a summary overview of what it is. You've got a, a southern dam area down here. You've got a large quarry area here where they're excavating out material to build the dam, and that's going to make the, the, the reservoir deeper in this location. And the uh, 777s basically are hauling different materials from this area. There's a stockyard crushing area here where they're building material for building the concrete core for the dam and for different materials that go in different locations in the dam, which is in this top area right here. And of course, you've got the whole roads between it. Here up here, you've got a maintenance yard and a lunch room area where the guys go um, at lunchtime and break time. So you'll see that the haulage routes are primarily from the loadout area, which is the quarry, down to the south, the loadout area up to the main dam, the south part of the dam or the north part of the dam here. And then they have this kind of lunch break area. There is a stockyard up there as well. So they have sometimes taking materials up to the stockpile up here. But more often than not, when the trucks are running this route, they're running up to get their lunch or having their break time. So it's a relatively simple site in terms of the structure of it. But in each of these areas, they've got multiple materials. So they've, they're running about 12 different types of materials uh, across the project. So they were interested in knowing which materials are going, how much material of each type have I moved this week, today, whatever. And they wanted to track this. And you can see this is live data. So right now, the truck movements that you're seeing on screen here are a few seconds old. If I click on a truck, if I zoom in on a truck, let's just turn this off a minute and zoom in a little bit. But if I click on a, I can catch it before it disappears off screen. When you when you're hovering over a truck here, you can click on it and it will pop up a. I can get one to just do it. It will pop up the kind of statistics for that truck at that particular point in time. Now, in terms in terms of the um, you know the usefulness of this is. You know, it's just telling me all my trucks are working right now. There's a couple up here that are parked up, you know, three maybe still on break or have just gone for break or whatever. Uh, all the other trucks are, um, are moving right now. In this chart, we can see all the all the trucks that are reporting currently, and we can tune in on any particular truck if we want to. So if I click on the little eyeball here, we can locate and zoom on that truck and go find it. If I find another one, let's go this one. It'll take me to picking the wrong ones here. Let's go to one that's actually working. So over here, this this truck here is working. And as I say, if you click on the truck itself, I'm not sure why it's not letting me get the, there we go. The, the pop-ups will come up and it's telling me here that it reported last time 20 seconds, 26 seconds ago. Its current speed is 11 miles an hour, 26 seconds ago. And the maximum speed it's driven in the last hour or two is uh, 34 miles an hour. And it did that at 9.31 this morning. And then today it's done 23 loads and 23 dumps. And it's done 56, uh, whatever that last value was. It's done 56 miles today so far. So for each individual truck, you can see that in this view. And one of the things that we got a lot of feedback on was it's nice to be able to do this and be able to go through each truck, but how can I see that in a snapshot? So we added a snapshot report, which is called the equipment snapshot. And that allows you to pick 
a whole category. Whole categories are groups of assets. So you have a truck 777, truck 740. Um, and you can create groups that you can then report against, or you can just say everything. And then the routes that you want to report against, um, and you might have multiple routes on a project, or you might have one route with all your locations in it, depending on how you set it up. And then your maximum speed on site, you could say 45 miles an hour, for example, and anything over 45, you want to report that. So then you hit launch report. And at that point, it's going to run into the report and give me a snapshot view of where I'm at currently. So in here, we can see very quickly that these two trucks are the poorest performers, three and six. They haven't done anything today. They, they haven't been moving, so they're either in maintenance or whatever. So there's a reason for this, probably, that they're either not needed today or they're maintained or the drivers didn't show up today or whatever the reasons are, right? But you would probably know that by being on site, but looking at it remotely, all we know is that these two trucks have been parked up for all this period of time. Now, these little blue um, little blue markers here are when the GPS says it moved by more than a certain amount. So if it's gray all the way through and there's little blue bars on it, and it's not solid blue like these blues down here, then we know the truck isn't moving. So it's basically sitting there in a yard somewhere and it's doing nothing at this point in time. All these trucks down here are working and we can see the load and dump events. So the load is the browns and the dumps are the whites here. So we can see up here the, the kind of scale. So we can see the kind of cadence of load and dump during the day instantly by looking at the screen. We can see when they took breaks from here to here, there's a break here and then there's a break right here where all the trucks basically stop for a period of time. This could be a shift change, but they have a longer break. This could be a coffee break or whatever, breakfast break or whatever, that the guys stop for half an hour at this point in time in the morning. You see the timeline and this screen basically will give you all the information for all the trucks. It tells you their ranking out of all the, out of this kind of group of trucks. It tells you the speeding events that they've done. So you can see none of them have gone over 45 miles an hour today. We can see the number of miles they've all driven. So very similar number of miles for the active trucks. And in the loads, you can see they're very similar, but some have done a few more, like this has done 29 loads, this one's done 25. So there's a bit of a spread by 10 o'clock in the morning, and they've been working since midnight. So this is a 24-hour shift job, so they're working around the clock. And so on this screen, you can see a lot of information just at a glance. Now, if you want to go look at more detail, because you see something on here you need more detail on, you can just click on any of these event markers or anywhere in the timeline for any individual truck, and it will take you to that detailed location in their journal for that particular event uh, at that time. So in here, we can see a lot of stuff. Now, there's a few things we've done in this screen, and we're continuing to evolve this screen um, now we've got it, is we had in this job early on, we, we put temporary power into them to do a trial. And in the trial period, we found that, you know, they weren't plugging the power in, the battery was draining out of the devices, and remotely, we couldn't really tell by looking at this chart what they were doing. And so we added this, like, show detail function and the show detail function added these two green bars or a green and orange bar at the bottom here. So we can see the current battery level of the device. So we can just hover over this and see it's at 100% and it stays at 100%. And then we know it's got permanent power. They've got permanent wiring into a lot of these trucks now. So consequently, not all of them, but some of them have got permanent wiring. And so consequently, they should be at 100% all day. But in here, we can see the green line tells us that power is actually connected and powering the device. So again, remotely, now I can look at this data and say, OK, I know what's going on in the project. The devices are plugged in. They've got decent power. They're 100 percent charged. Therefore, there's no operator issues or power outages or anything going on with the power of the device. And as a result, we get more reliable um, performance out of the devices because they're getting permanent power. They're never going flat and therefore there's no data loss of any kind. Um, if there's a communication outage, we see that somewhere else. We see the delay in, in communication, but the data is getting stored locally on the device. And as soon as it comes online again, it will um, send all the data it's recorded. So we don't lose data. We only lose it temporarily until it connects again. So if, if a truck goes out of range for self-service, like in the West Virginia coal mining operation, they often drive through the hills to go from the loadout location to the dump location, which is at a barge on a river. They have to go through the hills. They lose uh, your connection for up to an hour on that route. So we don't get any data about the truck for that hour. But when it gets back online again, we get all the data for the hour that's missing and the data records get updated as if it was continuous. But you'd miss it for that hour if you were looking at where is my truck right now. You'd be potentially an hour out. But we'll tell you that it hasn't reported for an hour. Um, so we know at that point that it's, it's out of date information. So this snapshot helps us really diagnose problems and we're continuing to evolve some of this diagnosis and, and stuff. And the reason for that is that you can't stop these trucks. You you know, there's, I can go up to this site at three o'clock in the morning. 
if I can go there at four o'clock in the afternoon and they're the only two access points I get to the machines on site during the day. They don't want people near them. They don't want the operators interfered with or the operations interfered with. So at the end of the day, you have very poor access to these things once they're running. So being able to see more information remotely while they're working is more and more important for us as a company as we're supporting more and more customers with this. So the snapshot is extremely important. But let's say I want to see what this truck was doing at this particular point. Where was this dump location? It tells me it was MD downstream. So it tells me the locations like quarry, MD downstream. So I know what he's working. And if I go back through all these and they're all downstream loads, and then after this break, they're still working quarry and upstream now. So they switched at the break shift. They're doing downstream in this shift and they're doing upstream in this shift of those two locations. So if I click on one of these loadout locations or dump locations, that will take me to that truck in its travel journal. And I can now see exactly where that truck is at that particular point in time. So that's where the truck was doing that dump. And all the dump locations that that truck has been done are these little purple arrows that you can see. And so if if he's using manual dump and he presses the dump button, we can see the distribution exactly of where he pressed the button. If he's doing auto dump, it's a certain period of time after he crossed this boundary. So it could be 10 seconds or 30 seconds after he crossed the boundary, it would capture it. Now they're doing manuals because their haul path, if I look at it vertically down, this is the upstream, this is the downstream location. So if they're dumping in this area, that's fine because they come in here and they exit here. They only enter one dump event, but if they go up here, they enter here, they exit here, they enter here, they drive through here, then they exit, enter, exit. And so they have two dump locations that they have to go through to get to this one. So in this case, auto dump currently isn't working for them because they have to drive through one area to get to another. So they're using manual load and manual dump, but they are interested in looking at the sort of dump sensor as soon as we get them ready to put them on the machines to do the auto dump, then we wouldn't need to know. Um, we wouldn't have to use manual dumps at all for that because they are. This company was the one that was telling us that they get the odd guy that presses the dump button down here when he gets close to the loadout location and we need to stop that. So by doing what we've done so far, we've managed to uh, mitigate the, the, the operators from pressing the buttons in the wrong place and they are capturing the data correctly. But the nice thing I like about this is the spread and the distribution of the materials. It tells me, you know, where they're working exactly, north, south, south, or they're working in this area or this area. So if, if they're working linearly along something, we can see the progression of the of this um, lift, if you like, as it goes from left to right or right to left across the area. And we can see all the activities. Now, each activity is paired. So if I click on any any load location, I can see that, but I can also see the, the pairing of the matchup when I go to the events list, I can see the pairing matchup of where that load went precisely. So we're tracking not just the load location individually and the dump location individually, we're actually pairing them. So we know that this load went to this dump location and we know what date and time that happened and how long it took, et cetera. Now the timeline gives you, you know, a summary information for this particular operation for, for this period of time. So you can specify any period of time here. So if I want to look at this for last week, for example, I can go in here and say, show me from this date and hit the little checkbox here up till the end of last week. So now it's trying to calculate that week's activity. Now it's showing me that whole week's activity for the current truck that I'm looking at, and I can just jump between the trucks. And for that period of time, it would show me all their activity. So in here, you can see that they're loading in different locations. There's, there's, there's groups of loadout locations. So either they've got more than one excavator working down here or they're just moving the excavator between locations. Depends on the timeline for that. They, they're going up to this lunch break location and you can see they're moving up to these two dump locations south of the, uh, the border and up and north of the border here for doing the calculations of this. And they've now recently started dumping in this location as well um, in that area. And all these other things are entry and exit events that are going on along the way. Now you can filter what you want to see in here. So up here I'm showing all of the activities, but if all you care about is the load and dump events, you can just clear all the activities and just say, show me um, the the load and the dump events. And if you got fueling, you could say, show me when they got fueled, if you're interested in that, for example. But any of the activities that we track are all listed here, and you can choose any of them to display. And then once you're done with that, you just click out of here. And now it's not showing me the entry and exits. It's showing me all the loads and the dumps. And you can see in general, they're capturing all the loads pretty well, but there's the odd dump location in amongst all these loads. And that's this why this oops, I forgot the dump button is so important because if they get down here and they forgot to press it up here, when they press their oops button, it could tell it it's up here. Right now, this operator is still pressing the dump button. And as a result, there's a few dumps over the last week 
where they've been recording them in the load zone rather than the dump zone, for example. But we can refine this further. And as we get more and more users doing more and more work with us, we can identify more and more of these kind of issues and then program the tools to make them even more robust for capturing this kind of data and give you more options for capturing loads and dumps, et cetera. But in the timeline now, we can see through here the load dump, load dump. Because I filtered it to loads and dumps, all I'm seeing is loads and dumps. And I can just click on any of these and it will show me the load that's associated with that particular location as I go. And if I want to see, this is the timeline at the bottom. So I can jump around in time. So where was he at this particular point in time? Now the truck would be highlighted on screen. So he was parked up up here at that particular point in time. And if I want to, I can play back activity. So I can go into settings, change this to 20 times speed, click on the play button. And if I got a decent time, let's go to a point when he was actually working somewhere, which might be a bit more useful. Let's go here somewhere. So right now at this particular point in time, if it's playing, then this truck would now start moving along the, the, the path that he worked on at that particular point in time. Now, this is a week and a half of activity. Normally, you would do this on a single day or the current day and just see what he was doing or play back one day of activity so you could see the events or the processes that he was going through at that particular point in time. I may have picked a point in time when he wasn't doing much here, but if we just jump around a little bit, hopefully we can get him to do something. You can see there now he's actually processing, he's moving. And now he's running back along that path. So if we want to track a truck's activity, we've got all the information we need about everything he did that day, all his activities, we can filter them and we can see the timeline and we can play it back. So if we want to replay what was going on at that particular point in time or to try and analyze a bottleneck or a queue up or something like that, we could potentially see that through this kind of data and replaying the information. And we're interested in, you know, what do people want to do with this kind of information and what kind of tools could we use to mine that? So that's the, the sort of um, the travel journal. So dispatcher is your overview of what's going on with all the truck. Travel journal is truck by truck and you can choose or machine by machine. You can choose a different machine and it will load the data for that machine. And now you can start looking at that one if, if that happens to be the problematic machine for the day. And then you've got these other options. So once you get through the, the equipment snapshot, you get through the travel journal and dispatcher, then you're really into the reporting functionality of the system. And the reporting you have is this events report. So events basically takes you in. You can specify a filter here. So you can specify a start time and an end time. You can tell it what type of events you want to track. If you've got tags on those events, you can tag the button pushes or the auto loads, auto dumps with certain information like a project code or something like that. And then if you put a filter on here, you can pick the, the tags that you want to use. And if you do that, then it will further filter the, the, the list down. You can tell it which routes you want to look at. You can tell it which locations on that route you want to look at, and you can pick the ones that you care about. You can tell it which equipment you want to work with, which drivers you want to work with, and which materials you're interested in tracking. And at that point, you can say, if the material wasn't defined, then you can say include without materials, and it would just pick up all the other reports. Now in here, you can say, show me the data only with no map, or you can say, show me the map as well. And in this case, for all of the equipment and all the operators and things you've selected, this is the information that's available for this period of time. And you can see the map to show you that data, and then you can scroll down, and now you've got the detailed report for all of that equipment. So it tells you for by the equipment, so these are the equipment numbers. If you want to filter it, you can change it. So this is all the 777 number four, and you can see the dump load, dump load, dump load cycle, and you can see the zone material type that it was, it was hauling. You can tell it where it was locating it, um, where it was hauling it from or to. So quarry to MD downstream, and you can see during the day whether it changed. And then you can see things like the total weight that was uh, was loaded, and that's part of the whole profile. So if we say it's a uh, 40 cubic yards and it's got, you know, two cubic yards, or sorry, one cubic yard equals two tons, then you'd end up with 80, you know, 80 something tons per load. So you can choose your whole profile and then capture that information automatically as you go. And that's then how it's accumulating the volumes that were done by day. If we look at things like the cycle time report, the cycle time report, again, same kind of filtering at the top. You can say group them by route, and then you can say which route do you care about? So I'm going to pick this one, and then you says which equipment do you care about? And I'm just going to say all equipment and all drivers. And then emit cycle time is greater than a certain amount of time. Why would we want to do that? If you have a truck that loads and then goes to the lunch room and has an hour break for lunch, and then he drives back after lunch and goes up to the dump zone and dumps, his dump time for that particular haul will be over 60 minutes because we have 60 minutes for lunch and five minutes to get to lunch and five minutes to get back, then it's going to be a 70 minute haul. 
that 70 minute haul might be completely different to the average 20 minute haul or 30 minute haul that they're doing. So you can go in here and just say use 35 minutes as my my maximum. And so any long hauls that go overnight, you know, you might load up at night, park up and then dump in the morning. Anything like that where the cycle time is going to get interrupted by some longer break, you can omit those cycles in the calculation so that you get good average meaningful data as opposed to capturing some of those really long hauls. Or you could look at it and say, no, those long hauls are part of life. And if it biases the data a little bit, that's fine because that's really what's happening. So you can choose whether you want to do this or not. And you can say generate the report. And when it reports the cycle times, it's going to give you the by in this case, by the route, by the equipment, how much, uh, how many cycles, how many loads it's done. And you can then start mining through that data. So here we can say for this route, if I open this up, these are the dump to dump times, dump to load times, load to dump times, load to load times, and emitted cycles. So in this case, that for the whatever it is, 10 trucks, there were 43 cycles that were greater than 35 minutes. And it tells you the minimum amount of time. It tells you the the um, number of minutes in the 90th percentile, and then the average and the maximum. So here you've got like all the information that you need to determine what these emitted cycles are really meaning. But up here it tells you how many cycles there really were in each of these pieces. So these should all be somewhat similar numbers. And then here it's telling you the min max average uh, time it took for each of these um, cycles. So this is giving you some detail, but if you want more detail, then you can go to any of these and say, well, let's take a look at the load to loads. And that's the detailed information that you can dump to Excel or CSV and you can get at the data if you need to. So here you've got uh, chimney hollow load to load, and it's this, this operate, this uh, equipment, this driver, this one took 34.9 minutes and distance was 2.06 miles. So you can track the variations on the distances potentially. And then you can see the date time, you can see the weight, the volume, and the date and time of the, the dump location. So you can see, oh, this is load to load. So this would be load to load, and it's got the different times between these. So you can see in this report all the information that you asked for, and you can slice and dice it and mine it, or you can output it to CSV, Excel, PDF, as you see fit. So that's your cycle time report. And then the other report you're going to use a lot is the statistics report. And this gives you more information um, in a slightly different way. So in here, I'm going to say include materials because I care about which materials are getting hauled. And I want to see by route and material is how I want it filtered. Then I'm going to pick all these filters and this date and time range and hit generate report. And at this point now, this is going to give me the information for all of the trucks. So in this case, Chimney Hollow Reservoir is my um, is my route. I'm using Weathered Rock in this case, and these two trucks are the ones that hold it. And these guys did, this one did one load, this guy did seven loads, so giving me a total of eight with this amount of volume. In this case, that material wasn't given a, a, a tonnage ratio, so consequently it's, it's reporting it as zero volume or zero weight. But this one down here, this is zone four material, again on this route. These are the trucks that have been hauling it. These are the number of loads that they've done, and this is the total volume and the total tonnage of that material type that they've done for the load. And then the dumps uh, are doing the same thing over here. And over here, if we were doing bucket loading, which they're not, but if we were, you would be capturing the bucket load information over here in the right hand column. And again, you can sort this report as you see fit. And again, all of this information is available to you. Once you've got it in this form, you can copy it to a clipboard. You can dump it to CSV, Excel, PDF, uh, or whatever you might need. Now. A lot of this kind of reporting, if you have data that um, needs to be supplemented, like in Canada, the QM company, they had this um, uh, dump location where every time they dumped there, they got a ticket. It was a third party dump location, third party ticketing. So they would get a spreadsheet on a Monday morning for the previous week's dumps and the tickets associated with that. And then they wanted to be able to upload that information using a spreadsheet upload and associate it with uh, the load or the dump location or the dumps that were being captured by our system. So we do a time correlation. This ticket was at this date and time, the nearest date and time ticket over here. Uh, dump location at that, that same spot was this one. Match it up and then we match the ticketing numbers up with that so they can match up all their tickets with the dumps um, by machine, by operator automatically on the back end just by using a spreadsheet upload, for example. So we do a lot of work around this. Also things like if there's incorrect data, we do allow you to change like the material that was being hauled or the location that it was being hauled to. You can do mass changes to the data if you want to, if you're an administrator and you're given the privileges to do that. So if you get somebody capturing the wrong material for a period of time, you can go and correct just one record or a whole set of records for a period of time. 
if you need to fix the data on the back end after the fact, you can do that. So these are the main the main functions of the system. There are many others, and one of the newest things that we're working on is what we call the the volumes um, snapshot. And the volume snap, I'm just going to show it to you. I'm just going to go into here. I'm just going to run volume snapshot, which is a a hidden feature of this account. And right now, it's a hidden feature. You can use it. We're not hiding it. We're just making it not part of the UI until we've got through the final definition of how things look. But in here, for example, I can pick the project that I want to work on. I can select the locations that I care about um, for my volumes. In this case, I'm going to say select all of them. And I want to select um, work orders. Work orders are something else we're working towards releasing soon. And I can maybe give you a quick idea, overview of what that does in a few minutes. But in here, the the we're capturing loads and dumps for cut and fill. And we can say, when do we want to look at? We can say today, this week, or a period of time. So I'm going to say this week. And in here, I'm going to then say, give it a name. So I can save this as a shortcut. So I'm going to do AS demo. And uh, hit save. And that will save it so I can recall it. And if I want to go in, I can add more filters in here. So I can say only show me certain whole categories and only show me certain routes or only show me certain materials. And then I can also set targets for the quantity. So like for the query, how much material am I taking out of the query or how much am I expecting to take out of the query in this period of time? So you can put in a number in here and then when it shows you the volume snapshot, it's going to show me the actual versus a target number. So if you know you've got a cut zone and in that cut zone, you've got 27,000 cubic yards of material. You can plug the cut zone number and in that in here. And then as you run these volume snapshots, it's going to compare the actual that came out of there with the design quantity that you did in your estimate or in your in your office calculations. And it can show you the burn downs and the differences uh, over time. So once you're happy with this, you can hit calculate volumes. And now it's going through the calculation process for all of the areas. And it generates you this kind of view. And we've got a few refinements to make to this, but in general, what it's doing is it's it's showing you the geofence boundaries. And then it's showing you within those geofence boundaries the volumes of material by material type that are coming out of there. So out of this query, this blue material, if I can zoom in a little bit. Um let's change this way a little bit. It's a bit. So the blue material that's up here is zone four material and there's 36,821 cubic yards of that material gone out. The purple material is zone six material. So there's a purple area like over here. This area here is the purple material. So zone six is coming out of this and zone four is coming out of here as well. So for each of these areas in that, you can see the total amount of material that came out. And then if I go up to the dam location, you can see in this location, this is my fill material. So if I zoom in on the top of this, um, you can see that this is your fill material and it's telling you the amount of material that came out of there. So it's again zone four material um, and it's weathered rock that's coming in, into that area. And so we know the amount of material of each type that's coming in. Now this is a kind of a quick 3D view. So we've got a little bit of work to do in terms of the way these names interact with the graphics, which is why we haven't released this officially yet. And also we we, we need to kind of work on things like the scaling of these cylinders so that they're not huge when you measure over a long period of time, for example. But in general, the idea is that we can show you all the zones, we can show you the quantities that are getting moved by material in a snapshot view, or we can show you this kind of view, which breaks it all down into kind of a little simple report that you can see for each material type, the total amount of cut, the total amount of fill for that job. You can see whether these are balancing or whether there's a delta. And then down here, you can see the volumes by the material type, and you can then see where those materials are getting distributed. So again, trying to take all the information that's being captured and giving it to you in a similar way that we do with the equipment snapshot, trying to give you a volume snapshot that gives you exactly the same kind of overview for the areas that you're really interested in right now, but looking at in terms of this project or all your projects in the same area, for example. So volume snapshot is, is coming. And then the last thing I wanted to kind of just show you before we kind of wrap up and answer questions is this thing called work orders. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we were contracted by a big um, coal mining operation in Africa um, through the SciTech in Africa. They they asked us if we would help them build uh, an earth moving monitoring system for their backfill operations primarily. Um, they have primary primary um, excavation haulage for the material that they're excavating the, the coal mining operation. And they have a system that tracks that, I think they use modular mining. But when it comes to the secondary 
they can't justify the cost of modular mining for just doing the backfill operation, but they wanted to monitor that. And they contracted us to build a system for them to do that. So we built that and delivered it. And that was using the concept of work orders that you'd say, okay, I've got this backfill operation. It's got, you know, this is the starting surface. This is what I'm designing for my backfill, you know, with a capping in their case. So the coal self combusts if you don't cap it. So you have to have a capping layer, which is a secondary action. And then they basically haul the material to those backfill locations using conveyors, and then they have dozers on the on the on the material, kind of leveling it out and compacting it. And then they put the capping on top, and then they they grade that. And so they wanted to kind of monitor that operation in real time, and they asked us if if we could produce the system. So we came up with the idea of work orders. The work order captures the starting, and the ending surfaces, and then you can fly the sites in between, or you can use in that case, their case, they were using some of the machine production information as well. And we can then monitor the progress of that operation against the target and show you burn down charts and 3D views and cut fill maps and stuff like that. And having done it for them, we then said, OK, we've, we've prototyped it as a sort of standalone product. Now we're going to roll that back into Tracker. And so we've started the process of doing that. We're pretty much there with it. We've got a few refinements to do for this one as well. But I'm just going to go to our test environment just to show you kind of what this looks like. And I'm going to log in here. Oh, sorry, wrong one. I should have logged in with Bill's login here. Okay, so in in here we have this work orders function. So if I go into work orders here, this is um, a kind of a, a site that I've used just to, where I have some data. I've just built some example models out of this and. In here we have the map view. Um, our map views are showing you like a standard, you know, map, you know, satellite imagery, and you know you can do it with streets, or you can show it with satellite imagery. The satellite imagery, as always, is going to be out of date as soon as you start breaking ground. It might be out of date already, and so we have the concept of map layers. We can add all these. This is part of our current system, so you can use this today without this addition. Um, but you can pick up different layers of information, and you can decide. And upload, you know, information, multiple images for drone flights that you may do on the site, or you can capture cut fill maps from TBC and publish them as an image and then load it, or you could do things like PDF files and capture them as image and load them. So you can put any kind of image in the background. Um, and once you've done that, then you have the ability to go into your work orders here and you can look at the list of work orders for the project that you're looking at. So I'm looking at this default project. And here we've got a number of different things that are in, in our kind of test environment. This is my example from Florida. So if I click on this Earth, this Earthworks work order. The concept of a work order for the application in, in, in the mines was that you define a work order that defines the scope of the work that you're trying to do. So you might have a cut um, to fill work process that you're trying to track, or you might have a complete volumes for the whole project that you're trying to track. And so you load into this the basic information. So you can say, uh, manage the surfaces and in that process you can tell it which is the starting surface which is the ending surface and that will then use the volumes calculator in the system here to calculate the quantity that's associated with that task so we know the volume and then after that you can go in here and say which days of the week do you work so you could say it's a five-day week or you could say no i'm working seven days a week and then you can go into here and say each day of the week what is your production expectation for that day so you could say i'm expecting a bit of move for the crews that I'm assigning to the task here, I can I can expect to move you know 2,500 cubic yards a day, and I've got 2,500 cubic yards of fill today each day, and so what it does it takes the total volume that you've defined, divides it by the the tar the target production per hour, and at that point it's going to then define how many days it's going to take to do that task. So that becomes the scheduled date. So if we started at this particular date and time, we can put in a start date. It's going to take us this number of days to complete that task at this production rate per hour for these numbers of days per week for the equipment. Now, on top of that, you can tell it some tolerances. These are tolerances for how what it what defines when it's complete. So in other words, when the surface is at plus or minus, let's say half a foot, we can assume it's completed, for example, or plus or minus a tenth of a foot if you're doing something more accurate. So you can put in tolerances here, and it's that what will use you, it will use that information to help you understand when you're approaching completion at any particular point. It does color coding of the site and stuff like that. And it's working. 
You can put in inspection and approval time. So you, you say at the end of the project, it's going to take me three days to get it approved. And in that project, I know there's some holidays or some you know, vacation time, 4th of July shutdown, whatever you might have, you can put in some time for that. And that will add and extend this schedule out according to the amount of time you put in for these two things. Now, at that point, once you get through the whole process, when the work order is done and completed to your satisfaction, you have an approval and acceptance that kind of signs off the work order. And if you need to put in notes during the work order, like you lost production because of bad weather, you can put in notes in here to keep a record of things that went wrong or things and decisions that you made along the way. And you can see the work order history of all the notes that you made as you go. Now, once it starts work, in other words, the first production data or first survey information comes in, it, it will tell you how far you've got in terms of production burn down, and it will tell you how much you've still got to go, and it will recalculate where it thinks it's going to end based on the information that you're providing it. So it will tell you you're overrunning or underrunning on this particular task or this particular project. And it will tell you up here, and it's colored red right now because I'm behind schedule. If I was ahead of schedule, it would be green. If I'm close to schedule, it would be orange. And so the colors of this, this screen change from you know green to orange to red, depending on where you're at in relationship to the schedule that it's calculated. Now, you can always go back and recompute these. So if you want to change this to 3,500 or you want to change it to 1,800 because that's all you're achieving, then you can go in here and put that in. If you lose rain days, you can go in here and put eight rain days in here, and that would extend the deadline out. And then you can see that, okay, based on what I'm able to do, within the constraints that we're working in, I'm still on schedule, but I have lost some time for rain or whatever on site. So this this progress kind of status is giving you one information set. Now, if I go to design and progress, this takes me into a 3D screen that allows me to start seeing the information associated with the work order. So this is now looking at the data graphically. I can go in here and say, I've got my target surface and I've got my starting surface. If I click on the surfaces up here, I'm going to turn these three on and I hit apply, and that takes me now to that location on the job, which is actually somewhere down in Florida. <clears throat> and this is the site, and in here we've got three maps really. We've got the cut fill surface, the target surface, and the starting surface. So if I turn these off a second, this is where I'm starting. This is the surface model, and it's currently colored green. I can change the color to kind of make it a bit easier to see or a bit harder to see, whatever you decide color-wise in here. And we may have a little bit of work to do in terms of shading to make this a little clearer. If I want to see this, the target surface, this is my design. So this is showing me where the red is above the green, it means I've got fill. Where the, where the green is above the red, I've got cut. So I can see where my cuts and fills are going to be between those two surfaces. And in this case, I've used those two surfaces to count a cut fill map. I don't have any surveyed surfaces for this in between those two. And this isn't really a design. I just use two surveys to calculate this. And then the cut fill surface here is my results. Currently, it's using this color scheme to define the color map. So where I've got yellows to reds, it's in, in in cut. And anywhere I've got light blue to dark blue would be fill. And I can grab that view and separate it out from the other view. And I can start to see various bits of information. So I'm now currently showing it as a cut fill map. If I turn off the cut fill, I can show the individual surfaces. But in here, I can show this cut fill as um, uh, the, the, the this kind of color scheme. I can display it by using what we call an elevation map, and this is the elevation map that I'm looking at here, or I can show this by slopes, and I can also go in here and say show it by elevation, but also show contours, so I can put the contours on the drawing and see the contours as well. So at this point, we've got all the main display functionality in here. Um, we can see the progress. If I go out and I add surveys, I would have surveys in here. I can add survey information to the model, and that would then start giving me the progress of the job. So starting from here, then I've got week one survey, week two survey, week three survey. And when I go into things like our burn down chart here, then the burn down chart will say I'm starting at this point. This is when I'm expecting to end. And then each time you add a survey, it would add a updated quantity information and show you the sort of chart. So if I'm coming in under schedule, my line will be trending down ahead of schedule. And if I'm falling behind, my trend line would be going beyond the, the schedule. So the burn down chart is, is meaningless right now because it's only showing you the start and end volumes. But as you start adding survey information into this, you start seeing the burn down charts. And that's what we did for the, the African mine. So they could see on any kind of backfill operation where they were in terms of the capacity of the backfill and where they were in terms of backfilling it based on their known production rates from previous uh, experiences. And that way they could determine when they start needing to think about moving the conveyors and start uh, building out the designs for the next set of uh, backfill that they're going to do. 
and their backfill areas were two million cubic yards. So a lot of lot of dirt goes into those, and it takes them about eight weeks to ten weeks to fill each one. So they're producing a lot of dirt, but they have a cycle and a cadence, and they use this to control that cadence and monitor the work on there. And we do have things like profile, but this profile for some reason, right last night when I was setting up the the meeting here. Um, uh, the, the profile isn't working today for some reason, so I can't really show it, but the profile allows you to pick a series of points and it will draw your profile drawing through the site and stuff like that through multiple points, um, but it's just not functioning in here, so I can't show it right now. So yeah, so that's kind of tracker. Um, hopefully it's a, an overview, gives you kind of a good idea of what we have available um, to you and where we're trying to head. Let's go back to the presentation just to kind of finish up here and talk about the last couple of things. Um, so work orders, we've talked about that um, and where that's heading. And our goal is to link that to TBC. We we did that for the, the product we did for Africa. So we're now building the TBC integration so we can populate starting surfaces, ending surfaces, surveyed surfaces, images and overlays and um, uh, create the work orders and stuff like that inside TBC. So if, you, if you're the guy that's driving the project from inside TBC, you can do that and upload all your information to the system. From here, that's kind of one area of work that we have ongoing. And if we then look at other up, uh, upcoming work items, this is really where we're focused right now is dump sensor integration, completing the volume snapshot, completing the work orders and the 3D visualization and integrating the cut fill maps and the scene into scenes with the equipment. So right now the work orders is kind of separate from the equipment, but we're going to integrate that so that the equipment and the work orders and the cut fill maps can all be integrated together. Um, complete the scenes work. Um, the oops, I forgot to load button. We've done the oops, I forgot to dump, but we haven't done the oops, I forgot to load. That's work in progress. Um, correcting for missing loads and dumps. So the sort of after the fact editing, we're working on some additional tools in that area. And then we're doing some additional debug tools that help us to track and um, monitor things like, you know, we, we, we don't know what's caused, you know, an outage, for example. So we're trying to capture more information about the operating system of the tablet and uh, the Android operating system and the version of our software and all that sort of stuff that's on the device so that we can get a really good handle on things like the battery level of the device, the, the um, battery temperature, the tablet processor, the tablet temp processor temperature, things like how long has it been since we last communicated and stuff like that so we can track and start providing more smart ways of handling those kind of situations when they do arise. Not so that they're happening a lot, but they do happen and when they happen, we want to be able to look at it remotely and better diagnose it and troubleshoot it and have it auto fix itself. So we're trying to get, get smarter about the way we auto handle certain types of activities and make them more robust from a user perspective so that you never ever see them at all. And it just happens in the background. And then TBC development, we're, we're doing the, the tracker integration, which is basically taking what we did for the earthworks for Africa to uh, into the tracker integration to give us the same kind of capabilities in here. And we hope to have all this sort of stuff done this summer. And we have other things going on too, but these are the main kind of work items for now. So we hope you like what you see. Um, we're excited that where Tracker's development has got to and where its evolution is taking us. And uh, its simplicity, um, yet robust reporting and its snapshots reporting, I think make it extremely capable for most people doing earthwork operations. And it's only going to get better from here. Um, and we're really uh, excited about where that could uh, take us in the future with you as customers. And so I'm going to open up for questions. It's 11.45 here. We've got 15 minutes left here. Happy to answer any questions if you have any. And um, please uh, uh, please ask. Or if you uh, like what you see, if you want to give me the thumbs up before you leave. If you don't like what you see, give me the thumbs down. And uh, if you'd like us to follow up with any of you, and uh, you know we can do trials with with you if you'd like to do something on site to kind of proof of concept then we're open to the idea of doing that with different uh, users and uh, we're happy to to start when you are so anyway i'll open up for questions at this point There's a name on this list that I haven't seen for quite a while. Hans Eulisher, are you there? Do you want to unmute, Hans? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh -huh. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> uh -huh. You in Sweden still, or are you still in the States? I'm in Sweden. You're in Sweden. Uh -huh. Okay. Are you still working, or are you retired now? 
I'm retired. Oh, you're retired. Okay. So you just but thought I'm, you'd. <clears throat> but I'm interested in what's going on. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. As always. Huh. Okay. Hans and I used to work together many years ago when he worked for uh, the Geotronics organization and Spectra organization and, and the Plus Three uh, Terra model organization in his time. And uh, he and I have worked together, I don't know what, Hans, about 25 years, probably something like that overall. Uh, well, yeah. So, but, yeah. But for 40 years ago. Uh huh. Yeah. Very good to see you, Hans. Nice yeah. for you to take the time out to take a look at what we're up to. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, can I just say if, you, if, if there's no questions, if you'd like to just you know give me a, a Tyler, I, Tyane, I think you asked a question here. Let me just see what the question is here. Uh, I have my hand raised there. OK, yeah. And then Silvana, you had a did you have a question or? Yeah, like I have a lot Hi. of questions. I don't Hi, know Alan. if I'll be. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Tyane, did you have sorry. a question? Did you have a question, Tyane? Yeah. Yes, I have a lot of questions. Um, I don't know if I'll be taking people's time, uh, but let me just put them out there. Uh, the first one is uh, for the geofencing. Um, I would like to say um, this is pretty much uh, interesting. Um, I don't know if there's such a system that is available currently that can beat this, uh, so I'll give you your kudos uh, on this. Um, it's uh, the geofencing. Uh, I just want to know in terms of layers, uh, let's say you're mining coal, as you say, there's overburden and there's coal there. Uh, are you able to, to import this uh, into the system? Even maybe it comes in a DXF format or anything oh. like that. So from a graphical, uh, map, m graphical map perspective, yes. So we currently in the system, if you take an image with line work on it, you can bring that in and it will show you the line work on it. In our in our earthwork system we did for the mine in Africa, we had an additional layer which was uh, KML files that you could load. So we, as long as you can write a KML file with the line work in it, you could overlay it. We haven't implemented that in the map view in Tracker yet, but that's that will happen. It just hasn't been done yet. So right now what we do is we capture an image in TBC which has the line work on it, which is georeferenced. Then when we load that, you can see the line work. So if you're looking then to trace in the the geofence locations, you can just trace it over the image if you want to. Now at some point we will add the line work, but it's not there today. Okay. But that's part of our map layers well, function, right? So it's just a matter of porting it across. So hopefully it won't be too far away. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And then in terms of your auto load and dump, um, uh, when you go to those uh, locations, uh, you talked about the time, maybe like uh, 30 seconds. So what about if you're there and like maybe the truck is on a breakdown, it didn't, it didn't actually uh, tip the load. What happens uh, when the bucket is swing, but this guy didn't actually swing with, uh, with material in the bucket, but it has swung. Um, how do you compensate for that? Um, that's second uh, second question. And the last one, in the case where the tablet gets damaged for any other reason, mechanical or any other way, um, what what will you what will happen to the data um, if it's not recorded? Do you have any logging uh, that happens uh, since that's your sole um, uh, um, system that you have? Okay. How, how how is this data backed up? OK, so I'll try and answer the three questions. So as long as the tablet is working and it's able to record information, it will continue to record the data. So the data is all there. As soon as it gets to a connection point, it will dump off the data. So you can take it into a Wi-Fi zone or you can get it onto the, the cell network. The data will come off the device if it's been recorded. If the tablet is damaged to the point where it can't record data, then of course at that point it would stop recording. But you would see that in the activity log. You'd see that that tablet wasn't recording data and reporting data and it would tell you how much time has elapsed since it last sent any information that was meaningful okay so we we do track it but it is not there's nothing we can do about it if the tablet can't physically record data right so if a sensor dies for some reason in the tablet which we haven't had yet but inevitably it will happen sooner or later like if the vibration sensor failed for some reason then you wouldn't be able to determine ignition on ignition off but it wouldn't stop you recording GPS locations for you know events like entry and exit events or load and dump events. So if the camera dies, you wouldn't be able to take any ticket information, but it wouldn't stop you capturing the ticket. It would just stop you from capturing the photograph of the ticket. So depending on the level of failure of the device would dictate 
what data could or couldn't be collected. It's not really down to our software. We'll capture the information, and if it can be connected, we can offload the information. So you wouldn't lose the data that can be collected. But if there's no data collection available because, let's say, the hard disk fails, then there's nowhere where we can store the data. So at that point, there's nothing we can do about it. The data after that point would be lost. And until you can fix the tablet or replace it with one that's working, you do it. Now, what I would typically recommend, you know, not because we've had any issues with battery failure or anything like that. We had one, let's say one tablet that failed within a week, the battery just died completely and it was brand new. We replaced the battery and it worked fine ever since. So that's not an issue. But that's the only tablet we've had that's failed in three and a half years. So these have been extremely reliable so far. We haven't had a single one that we've had to replace. But if there's a fear of that, having one extra tablet, these aren't that expensive. They're like seven, eight hundred dollars for a tablet. You could have one or if you've got a lot of fleet, you could have one or two spares that you could swap in and out pretty quickly. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, just configuring the the tablet to be associated with a specific machine that you've got set up on your system and you can change it over in a matter of seconds and start work again. So if you're if you're fearful of losing production data because you didn't have a device, then having a spare would be a way of solving that. You might lose a few hours of data because you had an outage for some kind, but as long as you can get a new device in there, you do it. So if you had a big operation of 50 trucks or something, I would recommend you to have one spare or something like that. That should suffice based on our experience to date anyway. Hey, In Alan. Yeah. If I could just briefly add, we record and send information every five seconds. And so the vulnerability you have is based on what your communications coverage is. So if you're in an area where you've got cell coverage, then everything's draining within one or two seconds of that data coming in and being created, like loads or dumps or positions. But if you're in a remote location where you have no connectivity, that's your exposure is how long are they out of reach. But once it does get within Wi-Fi or cell coverage, we can drain a day's worth of information in just a few seconds. OK, so that, that was hopefully at least partially an answer to your first question. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have been making notes as you asked because you asked three questions there and I'm trying to remember what the other two were. So if you could just just recap very quickly, just to prompt me again, what the other two questions were. Uh, that was the last one, the auto uh, load and dump. Um, what happens if it's swinging and that guy didn't uh, have anything on the bucket? And if the, um, the, 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 the dump truck stays, maybe it's on a breakdown on the dumping uh, zone, uh, but they didn't dump and then that 20 or 30 seconds has elapsed. Uh, what and how do you rectify those? So or how do you compensate for that? Okay, so the auto dump button has a breakout, so you can you can press the button to stop it from doing anything. So if you're in a zone and you know you're not doing what you're meant to be doing in that area, you can press the button to pause it if you want to. So that's one thing the operator can do. If if it triggers before it 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 tells you that it's going to trigger in 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. So it is a countdown. So you can see it's going to trigger. And if you know it's if you know you you shouldn't, you can just press the pause button and it will stop it from doing it. Right. So that there is an override there that you can do it. But if you missed that, and let's say the operator was preoccupied, forgot to do it, then the dump would be captured at that location incorrectly. And that would be just something you'd have to back out on the back end. Okay. That's the only thing we can do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it's all good. Thank you. Let me okay. give other chance. I'll ask. Yeah. Okay. So, Silvana, I know you're heading out. Are you still there? If you are, could you? Hi, just... I am. I was about to leave. Um, just, um, I have to talk to you in more detail. But, um, is this a standalone platform, or it's part of the RPS, the subscription that we currently have? No, it's a standalone platform. It, it, the subscription you have currently is for the TBC, um, all the RPS uh, tools yeah. for TBC. This is a completely separate thing, Silvana. So it's a, uh, you know, okay. you look at this and, you, and you're paying, when you buy Tracker, you're really paying for the number of assets you want to track. Okay. Yeah. So if you if you have, you know, 20 trucks or 50 trucks or scrapers or excavators that you want to put on there, then you pay per truck per year. And then there's a support um, fee that we put on top of that, which is just for us helping you get it set up and configured and then providing support and troubleshooting should you hit any issues during the year, yep. right? So it's our support contract. But other than that, that's Perfect. the only cost you have. And then it's the hardware you pay. The tablets are about, you know, 
all in by the time you buy the tablet, the bracket, the SIM card for you know a monthly fee. Um, you're talking about a thousand dollars roughly for each tablet with a bracket with different mounting options. So you know plus or minus a hundred bucks depending on the mounting option you choose. And then the mm -hmm. SIM card typically we're about like for for the amount of data we need, we're running at about we have a half a gigabyte plan on a pooled basis. So not everybody uses the same amount of data, but we have a pooling system. The half gigabyte plan costs about 12 bucks a month with any of the carriers that you have up there in your part of the world. So Rogers or Bell could be used. Um, and those will uh, give you everything you need and some spare. Now, if you decided that you have, you know, thousands of load tickets to cap capture, obviously images take up a little bit more space. So you might end up going from half a gig plan to a one gig plan if you're doing something extreme. But to be honest, we haven't got anybody doing that. So half a gig seems to cover everybody that we've got running so far on a monthly basis, right? So you're talking 12 bucks roughly a month for a cell plan per device, and then about $1,000 worth of hardware per device, and then 500 bucks a month for each asset. And then if you go for a large number of assets, then we can discuss what that costs mm -hmm. you for that that pool of assets, right? So, okay. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Can I send you um, my uh, the fleet we have, and sure. you can maybe prepare a personalized quote for us? Yeah. Yeah, do that, okay. and I'll be happy Perfect. to talk to you next week whenever. Okay, Perfect. that's fine. All right. I'll send you an email. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ivan. Yeah, I appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Anybody else? Okay, well, again, thanks, everybody, for taking two hours out of your busy schedules. Um, if you do have questions or you have interest, please email me. Um, you can get us at uh, alan.sharp at rockpilesolutions.com. Most of you know that. Or you can uh, send it to info at rockpilesolutions.com if you can't remember my name. And that will get through to us, or you can find it on our website and just press the contact button and request there. Or you can hit the support button in TBC if you're using that, just send a support ticket in and we'll handle it from there. But again, appreciate everybody taking the interest in the time this morning. Um, we'll keep you in the loop and we're going to plan to do one of these a quarter to kind of show you the progress that we're making each quarter. And uh, hopefully uh, you find this uh, interesting and potentially useful for your company. And again, if you've got any feedback or ideas or things that you'd like to see us do, or things that you would like to comment on how we're doing them you know i'm really interested in making this the, the you know the best possible tracking tool for earthworks operation out there and uh with your help we can get there i'm sure okay but thanks again everybody and uh we'll talk to you next time thank you thank you very much